The wedding season in India from November to March has a strong influence on the global demand of gold. In our Asian, Indian uh, and all type of uh, Asian uh, Dubai jewelry is for the good luck to start a new life or any good occasions, even for uh, wedding anniversary or anything like to do with, uh, with the good faith. So we always start with uh, gold. In a situation of ever-increasing demand, the Reserve Bank of India bought 200 tons of gold from the IMF in 2009 to supply the jewellery market. The global demand for gold in 2009 reached 3,400 tons, over 50% for jewellery, 11% for industrial and dental uses, and the rest, having risen sharply, reached nearly 40% for investment purposes. But the problem resides in finding all this gold. There is a lot here in the coffers of the US Treasury, but it's not exactly up for sale. Washington prefers to keep its reserve of 8,000 tons tucked safely away. It's the greatest reserve in the world, almost one-fourth of the reserves of all the central banks. The Bank of France isn't too far down the list, coming in fifth at 2,435 tons. But the demand grows constantly from countries increasingly leery of the dollar, like China. They are the world's leading gold producer, but plan on multiplying the reserve in their central bank by six, and their own production will not suffice. So they'll jump on any gold that's up for sale, and they're not alone. It, effectively, if you look at it, it means there's a shortage of gold now from the central banks of nearly 400 tons a year, because they were selling about 450 tons. Now they seem to be selling about 40 tons, or even in some quarters, buying. So you've seen a complete shift on the supply side from the central banks, which is obviously positive for the market, because it strengthens the gold market. So gold, there's not enough to go around. That's nothing new, but what is new is that the known reserves in the world are estimated at less than 22,000 tons. At the current pace of extraction, there's only 10 years worth left. In recent years, the profitability of gold mines has dwindled sharply. Costs go up about 15% every year, especially energy costs, but also the cost of chemical products and wages. Let's head for Salsigne, near Carcassonne. It was the last French gold mine. It had to close in 2004. Firstly, because it was no longer profitable, but also because of the pollution. The site, now in rehabilitation, is still under surveillance. This task is assigned in France to the Office of Geological and Mining Research, the BRGM, which operates on behalf of the state. Let's go down a bit more. We're almost there. There, that's perfect. Why did the mine close? For two reasons, environmental reasons, but mostly because of the price of gold on the international market, which was very, very low. So there was a lack of profitability. It's true that profit is at the very core of this domain. It was the last unique and only. The French mine of Salsigne in the oak department is closing today. It's the end of a mining operation that lasted 2,000 years, as it was the Romans who discovered the seam. Industrial mining at the site, however, truly dates back to 1909. A century later, the pollution of the site is real. As you'll discover, there was actually very little gold in Salsigne, but a lot of waste. In Salsinia, some thought they'd be rolling in gold, but now they're weighed down by pollution. There's toxic ore put away here 60 years ago. Since then, on this lunar landscape, everything has stopped growing. There's arsenic, copper, lead, zinc, lots of metals are present on the mining site of Salsinia. All of it out in the open? All of it out in the open, left untreated. Considerable efforts were made to diminish the pollution, but every year a ton of arsenic is discharged into the Orbiel River. There remain over one million tons of waste spanning the site's 50 hectares. Cases of drinking water intoxication were signaled as early as 1965. 
A few years later, an abnormal number of lung cancers were detected in the hospital of Carcassonne. But it would take nearly 20 years to recognize that these illnesses were due to arsenic poisoning. Even today, the vegetables of the Orbiel Valley are unsuitable for consumption. This is what's left of the underground mining site. With, with different sorts of carts. But I can actually see that it hasn't been completely cleaned yet. It definitely will be. We must note that at the time, the priority was preserving jobs, and it's true that in those years, the environment wasn't much of a priority for everybody. We mustn't lose sight of the fact that the first big environmental law was passed in 1976, and in the mining field, it wasn't until the 90s that good modern mining practices were put in place. The South Senior Mine supplied over 110 tons of gold since its industrial operations began in 1909. But it supposedly still holds about 30 tons. Enough to arouse the desires of some people today. If gold continues rising, we could reconsider developing certain gold mines in France and also retreating some old piles of tailings. It would be worth retreating them. We wouldn't even have to crush them if they're very fine. we just have to process them with cyanide to produce gold. All while knowing, however, that the environmental constraints make it very difficult in terms of public acceptance. Absolutely solid projects will be necessary and certainty that there will be no potential impact. Big mining companies don't always have these same qualms. They often prefer using raw material in developing countries where manpower is cheaper, ecological organizations are weaker, regulations are more vague and the legislation is less constraining. But the law of profit does not only concern the giants of the sector. Let's go back to a few kilometers from Toka Tindung in Indonesia. Also encouraged by the soaring price of gold, small artisanal and informal mines such as this one are spreading around the deposit. It's a worldwide phenomenon that is very dangerous ecologically. Here, cyanide and also mercury are used with absolutely no precaution or inspection. These small artisanal mines also feed the world's merging gold supply. the militants of a completely new cause, one that calls for fair and equitable gold, perhaps this paradoxically is where the future of the metal resides. We've no need for gold. To put it around our neck, to keep it hidden in a safe, there's no need. However, there are 15 million miners who help 100 million people live. They need it to make a living, and they do, and they only produce 10% of the world's gold. This means that the big mining groups only employ 10% of the population, but produce 90% of the world's mine gold supply. So there's a huge imbalance. Moreover, this artisanal gold produced by artisan miners is extracted rudimentarily and manually. So we can say that the value of a gold bar, which is sold by this artisan miner, will stay in the country it is produced. But for a bar produced by a big mine where everything is imported, whether we're talking about the management, the raw material or the investments, 90% of the profits are exported as dividends. Very little is left there. Patrick Schein knows this mine in southern Peru very well. It's an artisanal mine, the way he likes them. Welcome to Santa Filomena, to the Sotrami, the company of mine workers. In this dusty desert, at nearly 3,000 meters high, visitors are rare, but always welcome. Even to the weekly miners' meeting. They've nothing to hide. 
Hello, everyone. Starting next week, earmuff hearing protectors are mandatory, and so are safety goggles. As far as safety is concerned, there is no group.